Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm really excited to welcome back to the Sports Psych Show, Dr. Ed Cope and Professor Chris Cushion. Gents, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dan. Good to be back. Likewise, thank you, Dan. Great to have you back on. Why don't we start by getting you to reintroduce yourself to the Sports Psych Show audience. Ed, do you want to go first? Yeah, great. So, um... Lecturer in sport coaching at Loughborough University, um, where I've been working for the past year and a half or so now. Prior to that, I worked at the Football Association for two and a half years in the kind of a, a curriculum design pedagogy role. Um, so that was kind of sandwiched between academic roles, um, which was at the University of Hull and Sheffield Hallam previous. Cool. And Chris? Thanks, Dan. I'm Chris Cushion. I'm Professor of Coaching and Pedagogy at Loughborough University. I've been there for 14 years. Feels like yesterday that I started. In fact, my anniversary is next week, 1st of September. Congratulations. So actually, years next week. Thank you. Um, I've been 20 years in academia, uh, but been coaching for 30 years. So a coach and somebody who's found kind of... Um, bit of a busman's holiday as it were so i researched the thing that i've always been interested in or work in a space that i've always been interested in. well it's great to have you both back on and last time you were you were on actually it wasn't that long ago it was, it was back in april um and we spoke at length about an article that you'd written uh, essentially about direct instruction and your argument um was that direct instruction had been misunderstood and perhaps continues to be misunderstood that direct instruction has become synonymous with simply telling players what to do or maybe even perhaps that's at its best and maybe at its worst just shouting at players but as you describe in the paper and as you described eloquently on sports site show that's not actually true that direct instruction offers so much more than that and 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 that's where i'd really like to start is just recapping a little bit about what we spoke about there in terms of direct instruction i mean you really think chris don't you that um we've got to a point where this is direct instruction is misunderstood it's got a bad rap for itself and and that's quite unfair really well, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Dan. I mean, it's. I mean, we talked last time about the history of um, the, de- the definitions of instruction and how sy- systematic observation research, particularly, had tended to reduce a range of behaviours, so including demonstration, feedback, questioning, <laughs> as as instruction. And over time, that's kind of morphed into just being instruction, um, and we seem to have taken. Um, a group of behaviours which were deemed instructional and reduced them to one as instruction and and framed it in a particular way. And we've tended to juxtapose that against some, you know, we we tend to go for binaries, don't we? We're either completely telling somebody what to do or we're not offering them any advice. And and we've ended up in this space in coaching, I think, where, you know, it's either direct instruction is just telling somebody what to do versus uh, the opposite end apparently is kind of a discovery learning where you just offer nothing and you just let people explore and discover and and as we spoke last time even we we think about the um, spectrum of teaching styles that, that that actually doesn't put you at either end it kind of puts you a little bit to towards the middle and then in the middle of a spectrum of teaching style so somehow we've we've reduced this down. So direct instruction for me is, or thinking about instruction for me really is trying to go back to that, those original conceptualization. And it's more about not being reduced to a single behavior, but being thinking about behaviors that are instructional. So which includes a whole range of other things and you usefully outside of sport, there's a whole space that talks about direct instruction that conceptualizes it in that very way. So it's a whole range of behaviors that includes that includes stuff like questioning and, fi- and feedback and demonstration that conceptualizes the direct instruction in a different way, um, which, are, which from my perspective, and I'm sure Ed will agree, I hope he does, kind of helps kind of broaden our thinking about 
you know, it kind of the opposite of reject, reduction, really. It broadens our conceptual understanding of it. It broadens the conceptual space of coaching and helps us to think about delivering sessions in 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 less of a binary and less of a narrow and reductive fashion. Well, let's ask him, shall we? Dr. Ed Cope, do you agree with Professor Chris Cushion? Absolutely. And, and again, kind of, I guess, to take listeners' minds back a little bit to, to mm. some of what we discussed last time, you know, there was, there was some early work in, in kind of coaching. And, you know, we know that researching coaching um, isn't, you know, isn't, it hasn't been going on for that long. Um, so if we go back to some of the early kind of literature that talks around coaching behavior, uh, coaching practice. Um, so there's a, a particular paper by Moore and Franks in 1996, which again provide uh, a definition of, of instruction, which is, as Chris has just described, really, um, not a single behavior, but rather a group of behaviors, which include such things as feedback, demonstration, questioning. Um, and so, you know, again, we're kind of at a point where it feels as though that type of work has been lost. Um, you know, I don't see it get referenced anywhere now uh, when people talk about kind of what instruction is or isn't. Um, and we seem to have entered a space where word association is very common. So by that, it's um, the word instruction is used and that gets associated with technical practices. So it, it has to be that. And it's very unclear in terms of why these associations or relationships are made. And what's also very unclear is, you know, if we try and trace back the history of, of, of how direct instruction has been conceived in the coaching or maybe even the broader sport mm. pedagogy literature, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's unclear what the empirical basis was to start making the associations that have subsequently happened um, and why instruction, I guess, has been discussed with such a narrow lens um I, I i'm not i'm not sh totally sure and trying to trace back this literature I, I, i'm not sure why those associations have been made um and as chris alluded to um you know the literature outside of sport which refers to direct instruction which actually precedes when this term was used in in sport um probably offers a a better basis from which is to think about this concept and um you know the the the, the usability of or, or or the way that we can frame it and think about it in, in the context of, of coaching and so today we're here to talk about a way that we can i suppose conceptualize direct instruction um or at least become uh, have a framework that can guide our direct in instruction um, and that's utilizing the work of uh, somebody called Barack Rosenshine and this is a professor of education or uh, was a professor of education from the University of Illinois he passed away a few years ago and he has a fantastic framework that you allude to in your uh, in the text that you, you wrote a few months ago that we've been talking about there and you guys think that that he that his principles instruction could be a really useful framework that coaches can use um, in order to guide their coaching pra practice, in, in order to guide their coaching behaviours. Um, Ed, do you want to start us off a little bit with regard Rosenshine's work? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the work of Rosenshine is really something that, that's only, I guess, well, I don't even know if it it, it really has found a, a, its way into sport coaching yet. I mean, we're we're talking about it here, but you know, there's certainly no publications beyond the short piece that Chris and I put together that links Rose and Shine with coaching. Um, so, as you rightly said, Dan, um, professor of education at the University of Illinois for most of his career, um, Rose and Shine was, um, I guess, as as most people of of that kind of generation that moved into academia. Uh, a teacher first um, and it was really kind of his experiences of teaching which then led him to doing a PhD and ultimately um, that served the basis for his research uh, around kind of ways that we can support best support learning so um, I guess yeah probably Barrett Rosenshine's best known work is his principles of instruction but Rosenshine has published widely on each of these principles in its own right so he talks and, and writes about questioning, which, again, has lots of kind of direct 
um, relationships with some of the work that's happened in coaching. Uh, he talks about the concept of scaffolding, which again is is a principle. But he again he, he he's he's researched and written about that particular principle uh, in its own right as well. So Rosenstein has a has a long history as a as an academic of publishing work around um, kind of the ways in which teachers can um, can create uh, learning environments which are most conducive ultimately. Um, and yeah, he's probably you know his most popular work. Um, well, was a well really was accumulation of the stuff that went before it. Um, resulted in a 2012 paper published in the American Educator, which um, is free, open access. So you can type that into your Google Scholar and uh, get the PDF. Um, a very very accessible piece in terms of um, how it's written, um, the kind of the, the length of it, but. Within that particular piece, Rosenstein discusses these 10 principles of uh, direct instruction, which um, in themselves have uh, a, a really strong evidence base to support. Um, the principles have been derived from three kind of main research areas, which are the cognitive sciences, um, the observation of what master teachers do, and we can maybe discuss what that word master means, um, you know, and again, we might think there's some parallels there with some of the work that's tried to be done in coaching. And then the kind of the, the third area is around um, the research on how we can help students learn uh, complex tasks. So that's the kind of where he's drawn upon. So he's drawn upon the work of, of obviously many others in order to then develop these principles. And I think just, just before kind of um, pass over, the, the crucial thing here is is that these are principles and they're not prescriptions. Um, so you know I know that Tom Sherrington, who is a uh, somebody who is who works in the teacher education space, has kind of taken these principles and is probably acknowledged as an as an expert in them in relation to teacher education and teacher development. Um, and and he he kind of you know notes that this is not a checklist. These are not checklists. These are not prescriptions for what coaches should or shouldn't do. You know, they are principles from which we can think about our coaching and our coaching practice. I, I want to explore the the three sources that Rosenshine um, studied and, and, and borrowed from that grounded his uh, principles of instruction. And then we'll go on to talk about those principles. But before we do, um, Chris, I mean, uh, you, you, you've you know, said off air quite openly and honestly that you're you're not necessarily an expert on Rosenshine's principles. But um, what I'm I would be interested to ask you here is that you know Ed talked. We spoke a bit about this last time, but Ed Ed talked about you know used the term teacher there. And you know when you go and discover Rosenshine's work and you read it, there's a lot of you know classroom. It's about the classroom. Um, and it's about physics and maths and English and how we help people learn those subjects. You've been a coach for 30 years. You're a coach of motor behavior. Before we get on to Rosenshine's principles, you know, how does this actually relate to coaching, Chris? In, in your mind, how does this relate to motor behavior? Um, I'm going to helpfully sidestep the question i think <laughs> and i i think the penny dropped for me yes. as a coach working in different sporting environments so you know as you do as you do your apprenticeship as a coach you work in you know you work in participation environments in community space you may be working in a talent development space and you may be you know, work with performance athletes or work in, an, in a high performance space. And I've been fortunate enough to work in all of those spaces and, you know, get the small violin out and play for the School of Hard Knocks and, you know, made lots of mistakes and and thinking. And, and the penny really dropped for me um, when I started to think about learning. Okay, so I've got a range of... So pe people would always say to me, you've got to adjust your session according to the... The group that are in front of you absolutely uh, you know of course you do because you know all groups are, you know within those domains all groups are different and then within domains you've got age and stage and all those things so there's a whole lot of whole lot of stuff going on mm. but the thing 
that always, you know, the penny drop for me is that I'm, you know, it, it's really about learning. So can I can I give this group of players something they didn't have before, something they didn't know before, something they didn't understand before, something they couldn't do before, and that works with, you know, that works with high performance and elite professional athletes you know you can always make them think about things differently or make them see stuff in a different way and that to me comes down to learning so as soon as I'm always a little uncomfortable with the kind of skill acquisition because it kind of it it, it almost decontextualizes the thing that it's there's this thing over there called skill acquisition but we've got people and context and all these all these sorts of things so so i i kind of sidestep the question and think about right i'm 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 learning i'm helping people learn something here now you know and and what that looks like and the shape of that obviously will be very context dependent but if i start to think about learning and now think about what i'm doing here well this stuff is about learning (laughs) It's not necessarily the subject matter or the context. Now, of course, you can't blindly pick up stuff and, you know, of course, there's lots of questions around, well, you know, learning a new, learning a, a learning quadratic equations isn't the same as learning something in a sport, of course, but we're still using the word learn, aren't we? It's still, a, it's still about learning. So for me, I'm, it piques my interest in terms of what can we understand about learning here? You know, there's, there's stuff that people didn't know, understand, or couldn't do before, and we want them to be able to do it and be able to transfer it and replicate it and, and perform it under pressure even, you know, which has a lot of similarity and crossover for sport, of course. So for me, I'm, I'm my mind is open. Really, if there's if there's something useful that we can draw on about learning from any of these domains, let's have a look at it. Let's not just dis, you know, let's not you know be closed minded and go. Well, it's in school, so it's not relevant. Always with teachers, it's not relevant. But it's about people learning things. So for me, is embracing learning is is the key really, and that's that's why it piques my interest, and that's why I like to read and explore and. Play, play with some of these things and see how they do transfer across and and you know surprisingly a lot of a lot of this stuff does when <laughs> you start start using it and playing with it and thinking about it and and you know it's not it's not a facsimile we're not picking up stuff and just blindly you know as, as ed said it's not a recipe it's not a tick box but it's it's really useful stuff to think about okay how how might i use that in my session how might i frame my session in this thing with solve this this athlete's or this player's problem, but think about it in this way. And it, it's, it's just incredibly useful in that sense. Just just to add to that, Dan, if I may, um, you know, just, just yeah, building upon Chris's point, you know, yeah, mm. th- this isn't, this uh, these principles haven't derived directly from, you know, sport or sport coaching or sport pedagogy, but then relatively few theories or concepts actually have. So, we could argue that that point applies for, for anything, really. Um, you know, everything's being taken from mainstream education or mainstream psychology, and it's being applied in coaching. You know, we we haven't developed really any any theories of our own, um, and so when these arguments get um, put at you, I would just throw it back and say, you know, it's it's, it's not like anything else in, in that respect. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's an important point to make for me, you know, because we, we are academics and we, you know, and I still like to look at the evidence base underpinning things and the evidence base makes a difference. And some of some of the evidence, if we look at, you know, if we look at work of Hattie and we look at uh, Paul Kirshner's work, or we look at Rosenshine, I mean, it's mountainous. It's absolutely the number of participants, the number of studies, the number of the type of studies that it's just a it's just a overwhelming amount of evidence that supports these principles and it and you know as a researcher in coaching it's actually quite disappointing how limited the research is about actual coaching practice and actually testing out some of this stuff and building our own evidence base so until we get our own evidence base we kind of need to 
you know, we can't just ignore this stuff. It's it's a colossal elephant in the room if we tend to if we if we ignore it. So we can't. So we have to say, okay, there's a there's a huge evidence base that supports a lot of these ideas, including systematic reviews and meta analysis that show time and time again that these things have an effect if we want to develop people and if we want to look at learning. And we just can't ignore that. So as much as anything, it's like, well, let's, you know, let's think about how we do that in coaching as well. How do we, how do we develop the, the research and evidence base and, and stand behind that? But until we do, <laughs> we, need to, we need to think about what else is out there, don't we? So what I'm hearing from both of you here is that the 10 principles we're going to talk about, the Rosenshine principles of instruction, help people to learn things this is about learning things yeah. and that could be it could be quadratic equations as you say chris god only knows i've forgotten about those uh, uh it could be um tiddlywinks it could be a golf swing it could be a tennis serve it could be uh the wives of king henry the eighth it's about how we learn things that's what i hear you say now what are these, and, 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 and actually with it, you're saying, you've mentioned some researchers there alongside um, Barrett Rosenstein, like say Paul Kirshner, and you're saying the evidence is mountainous, that these things, these principles help people learn across domains. Yes, there might be some nuances there within specific domains, but it, it, these are applicable across domains. I, I want to next look at the evidence that underpins these 10 principles, but I'm just going to read these 10 principles out so the audience can start to picture what these look like. So number one, daily review. Number two, present new material using small steps. Number three, ask questions. Number four, provide models. Number five, guide student practice. Number six, check for student understanding. Number seven, obtain a high success rate. Number eight, provide scaffolds for difficult tasks. Number nine, independent practice. Number 10, weekly and monthly reviews. These 10 key principles help people to learn things. And to find these principles or to, to, to create these principles, um, Rosenstein lent on three sources. Uh, number one, cognitive science research. In, in, in simple terms, um, uh, Ed, can you tell us a little bit about the underlying cognitive um, science with these principles? Yeah, so basically that refers to um, how knowledge and understanding, our, our knowledge and understanding of the human brain uh, can be used to help us design teaching strategies that will ultimately maximize learning so that in a nutshell is what that body of literature is attempting to try and achieve and is attempting to do um, so um, you know the cognitive science literature has developed over time but probably John Sweller is is one of the key theorists in this space who developed this concept of cognitive low theory which again is is associated and underpins um, a number of the principles that you just um, outlined there, Dan, um, particularly the ones that relate to um, kind of sequencing of concepts, the so things like presenting new materials, providing models, um, providing scaffolds for difficult tasks. Uh, you know, we can understand those principles in terms of the evidence that underpins them through the perspective or the lens of cognitive low theory, which essentially uh, is about uh, when information is is very complex or new, um, it's important that, and I'm going to use the word educators, uh, attempt to reduce the load um, that exists on the, on the learner's working memory as much as possible. Um, equally, when things are too easy, what we're trying to do is make things more difficult. So we increase the load because the learner can cope with it because they're finding the task easy. So... Um, there's a number of these principles that we can understand through through the concept of cognitive load theory, which is essentially talks about the relationship between the working and the long term memory. And so, I'm thinking back to when I was a golf coach, 
And if I was standing there with a golfer teaching this golfer and I was saying to them, I want you to move the club away in one piece, just as I've told you there, then I want you to uh, uh, cock your wrists and then rotate your left shoulder under your chin, feel like your weight on your right foot is shifting to your left foot hard on the way down in the transition phase, then uh, release your right hand hard through impact, holding your head back behind the ball, and then, uh, then uh, allow momentum take to take you to your finished position that's probably uh so much information that i'm going to overwhelm working memory so our our, our thinking yeah. in the moment and so nothing therefore is going to go into long-term memory so uh, that that pupil of mine is unlikely to learn because the information it's too much information it's not going to go into long-term memory unless you are maybe rory McElroy. <laughs> who and, and but this is the thing with it right and this is the thing and it's the thing with all these principles is that you know it's about their application to the context and the person that we are trying to develop so you know cognitive load can only be understood based on um who it is that we are trying to educate and who it is that we're trying to develop the learning of so if it's somebody who again we consider more expert then they can comprehend probably well, they don't need you to be telling them as much because for them it's about trying to retrieve stuff from long-term memory, get them to retrieve as much as possible. So the principle around cognitive load is is that, and this is where it links to this principle of scaffolding, is that cognitive load theory argues that when you are a novice or learning new things for the first time, you need more support from the from the educator. So whether that be a teacher or coach, more support is required. So more guidance. Um, and that might be through some instructions, as you've just kind of highlighted, maybe not so many, but some. Um, it might be through demonstration, which, again, has got uh, an evidence behind it in terms of what they would call worked examples. But we would probably call it demonstrations in a sport coaching space. Um, and uh, the notion of providing specific and corrective feedback, um, where as learners move from kind of novice through to expert and not to say that they're the only obviously they're not you know not the only two kind of ends of the spectrum if you like um we can fade that support mm. and so that relates to you know principle five where rosenstein talks about providing scaffolds of difficult tasks well as somebody becomes more proficient we can reduce that and um engage the athlete in more independent practice um allow them to respond to their own kind of feedback um that type of thing. In an athletic domain, you just made me think that, um, Ed, from an individual perspective, individual differences perspective, I remember, this, I don't want to make this too biographical here, but um, I will for a, a few seconds, um, just going back to when I first started field hockey at school. And uh, myself and one of my good friends was a relative newbie onto the school team, and um, a a, um, a hockey coach, our hockey coach, uh, I think, was actually cunningly trying to test out our athletic ability or the difference between the two of us. And unfortunately, or uh, well, yes, unfortunately, my, my my good friend had a great deal of athletic ability, and I had fairly average athletic ability. And uh, the coach set us up with a little bit of a hockey test, and it was a sort of you know, doing something defensive with the the stick and the ball. And I did it okay, uh, but somewhat averagely. And uh, my mate, who uh, was a beginner as well as me, did it absolutely brilliantly. Took it, took to it just immediately. So I'm assuming then that in an athletic and a sports domain, an individual difference could be just athleticism, just that dare I say this term that. that natural ability um is going to influence um you know how one instructs yeah you know and, and where's where's the where's the learner the athlete starting at basically you know what what do they already know um because if they already know something um then we've got a starting point from which things like feedback probably make sense to them because they have some prior experiences from which to draw upon and so again you know, one of the principles of cognitive load theory is, is that, you know, what we're trying to do is is always connect um, prior experiences with 
kind of the current learning experience to 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 try and make the connections or to support the learner in making the connections now if they know very little and i don't want to say that they they know nothing because i don't think that's ever the case but if they know very little then they might need to be shown or told something as a reference point to get them started so that's kind of what's being said around like cognitive load theory as a way to support learning for those who are maybe at different stages of learning it's about three or four chunks of information that we can take on at any one time would that be about right again yeah the individual the literature would, su- would suggest that um i guess some of that would be uh, task dependent um but yeah i think as a rule of thumb it's yeah three to five pieces of information is what we can deal with within our working memory at any one point in time um and of course the the goal is always to try and move things from the working to the long-term memory as as quickly as we can and again when we talk about this concept of what learning is cognitive load theorists and and those who kind of work in in, in that particular discipline area would suggest that you know learning's only happened once it's in the long-term memory and, and and so coming to you, Chris, I I, I suppose that uh, you know coaches listening in might be thinking, well, you know that, that's that's fairly obvious, and yes, giving too much information is a bad thing. But John Sweller's work uh, with cognitive load theory underpinning Rosenstein's principles, for example, um, uh, could be a useful frame of reference, an evidence grounded or evidence informed approach for a coach, which I assume you'd be a, a, a supporter of. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, I, I've um, I, I'm a little bit of rebel without a clue, rebel without a cause, rebel without a clue. One of the two. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I've actually modified going totally off piece here and wrecking the entire podcast. I've I've uh, I've actually created my own based on uh, Rosenshine's principles. I've actually created my own. <laughs> ah, uh, Professor Chris Cushman is holding up his own there. Well, you yeah, know what? Use this um, as an opportunity to tell the world. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not a cognitive scientist, and I I feel. And I'm not going to talk, talk about that stuff yeah. because I don't, I don't, I don't feel that. Uh, but I am a very pragmatic coaching person, and um, so I mean, taking t- so I, basically, I've reduced it down to s- seven principles essentially, which I try to think about in terms of my own coaching sessions. So, de- depending on the task and depending on the learner, requires some form of demonstration so if it's something completely new then people need to get an idea of what what it is we're trying for so again if if i just you know and again you want to try and assess Mm. where people are at with something so your golf example i'd I'd like you to hit the ball first (laughs) (laughs) so if, if we're if we're if we're teaching that golf swing then you need to show me something and then you need to hand the club over to the learner and they need to have a go and we need to see where where they're at, right? We need to absolutely see where they're yep. at. And then it's about thinking about what what information, what material, again, what do they need to know, understand, and do? What what? How do I present that material to them? And I'm thinking about how I interleave that or space that. So again, I'm drawing on those principles. And at that point, for me, it's then about questioning. So what do you you know what what are you noticing as a learner? What are your issues? What do you think are the issues? How does you know? Having seen the demo and have had a few attempts, what are your, where are you at now with this? And then it's about, for me, my fourth is about learner rehearsal. So basically, allowing people to play with stuff themselves. So they need to, they need to make their own understanding. They need to have it, you know, kind of reframe it into their own understanding, their own lang- language, be able to elaborate on stuff and really get a sense of what it is they're trying to learn. And then, and then based on that. I'm I'm stepping back in and I'm providing some models and some worked examples. So I see, for example, that you're trying to do this. Have you thought about this? Here's me, kind of. Here's how I might go about doing that. And then, it, then for me, um, step number six is about guiding practice, which is very much led by the coach. But again, it could be questioning, it could be correction, it could be instruction, it could be just letting people figure it out for themselves. It really depends on where they're at with the with a particular task and then it's about independent practice then and and putting that 
putting that under a little bit of pressure. So how are they applying the whatever it is I've t- taught teaching them? How are they recalling it? Again, I'll be again thinking about interleaving that and presenting problems. So I've kind of distilled it down to the seven things really, which it, again, it is a framework, a, a, a point of reference around, okay, how am, I, how am I thinking about delivering this material? And, and I think that we need to be careful with the language as well, because there are, it, when we talk about chunking and we talk about presenting small bits of material and we can only do five things, it makes it sound very much like we're deliberately slicing things into smaller, smaller bits. I wear disintegrating the whole, putting it into smaller bits and then trying to stitch it back together. Um, and for me, it really is about increasingly complex versions of the whole. So for me, the cognitive load stuff is I've got how I want to retain as much of the whole task as I possibly can, but I want to take the I want to take the pressure off the learner here. So what's a you know what are those points that I need to I need to do? So. Um, I'm I'm fortunate enough to, to to fly a little bit, so I've trained as a pilot. Have training as a pilot, so learning to land is the most difficult and challenging thing. Okay, and the very you know you've got speed, you've got rudders, and you've got pitch, so up and down, side to side, and you've got rudder pedals, and you've got speed. So the very first time that you do it, you you know there isn't breaking a landing down into smaller bits, and you either you know you're coming into land, you need to land. It's it's a complete task. But what's very interesting from an instructor perspective, and again, someone who's interested in learning, the very first time you learn it, the instructors said, "Right, I've I've basically got the throttle and the rudder. Yeah. You just point you just point the plane where you think it needs to go, and we'll." T- so so it's reduced load. The whole I'm still landing the plane. There's the whole task, but the instructor straight away taken the pressure off me. So it's for me these principles still apply to increasingly complex versions of the whole. So f- from my perspective, I'm certainly not advocating chopping up tasks into small pieces and making them look nothing like the you know disaggregating from the context. So that cognitive load piece is as much about how do we keep how do we keep as much how do we keep the task as whole as possible, but take the pressure off the learner while they're and then start layering it back in. So as you can imagine, you know, eventually you have the, the in an aircraft, you have the yoke and you have the rudder, and then eventually you have the power. So you're in charge of all three things, but that gradually comes as you get more experienced, increasingly complex versions of the whole. And for me, I think there's a da- there's a danger, again, we're in this space of misunderstanding in coaching, that as soon as we start talking about, you know, chopping things up and only giving this amount of information there's people going well you're straight away breaking this task into smaller bits and you're doing all of these things and making it very blocked and it's like well no that you know increasingly complex versions of the whole we're still learning through the task we're just removing some of the some of the load on the learner here so they can get get that understanding and connect it to where they are and just to add to that Mm, please i mean i think i think that's a great example but to add to it you know and this is why it's so important that people read as best as possible you know the this the original body of work here because that's what it argues for you know one of the key principles that the you know again and and i'm the same as chris i'm not a cognitive scientist but i do try and engage and read this literature uh because i do think it has applicability in sport coaching uh, and, and our understanding of how learning happens and you know a lot of the work that i read talks about the need for situated practice you know nobody in this space is saying that we should be chopping things up, as Chris said, or, or, or breaking things into fragmented parts. You know, nobody is saying that. You know, the, the, the key theorists or the key writers in this space are all saying that we need situated practice. You know, you know, we can't take things out of context, but it is, as Chris is alluding to, you know, thinking about as our role as a coach or a teacher or broadly speaking as an educator, you know, how can we ensure that what the person is learning is not too difficult for them that they become frustrated, um, kind of lack confidence, um, become completely overwhelmed by what it is that they're learning. But at the same time, it's not so easy that we're not challenging and we're actually not supporting learning because it's too easy and we can already do it. So it is very much working in that space where we are, you know, that right level of challenge. And and the skill of the coach, the skill of the educator is to um, design sessions, design practices, which are at that point 
of challenge when it's not too difficult that it becomes too much it's not too easy that they can already do it and i think that's that's really important so you know connect connecting to the to be learned material so i understand what i already know fits with the thing i'm trying to learn and i'm not i'm not kind of stabbing in the dark saying i don't i'm trying to work out a solution to a problem i don't understand so i understand where i am I understand how what I'm learning fits to that and the learning bits, the gap between those two things, isn't it? And in many ways, that's where our scaffolding. So where am I now and where do I need to be and what's the gap? And that gap's the learning piece. And for me, I think Ed's point there around task engagement is really, really important. It's really important. If it's too too easy, people just go do have one attempt or one try and go, yeah, that's too easy. I can do that. And if it's too difficult, they give up. And that really, for me, starts to, we start coming to that art of, you know, art of coaching space. Are you able to, you know, dial up and dial down accordingly? And it can be very individualized, you know. So if I'm I'm looking at a session and I can see I've got a group of players there and like, okay, this is too easy. I'm gonna I'm gonna increase the challenge here. So I'm gonna keep the practice the same, but gonna add something that makes it more difficult. And in, in in the same practice, at the same time, there's people here who basically this is too hard. So I need to be able to dial it down and get them in a space where the practice is meaningful for them. And that's you know that's bloody hard to do. <laughs> it's not it's not easy. You know, and we talk about the differences between you know what what what's great coaching look like for me. That's great coaching. You know, someone who can see what's happening, understand where their players, their learners are, and dial stuff up and dial stuff down accordingly to get task engagement, but also p- help people understand where they are now and where they need to be. So there's that kind of space. And I think it's this this type of discussion which would serve the field of coaching so much more productively than maybe some of the current binary dichotomizations of, of coaching and coaching practice. And and I think, again, this is where these principles, you know, have, have real usage because, you know, what we can do is, as and, and for me, it's, you know, how do we build these things into coach education, coach development, whereby we start to work with coaches around some of these and say, right, what do they look like? You know, how can we look look at some of these principles and, and bring them to life within your practice? You know, so when we talk about asking questions, like what what does that what might that mean? So, you know, there is, of course, more meat on the bone if you read this work around what that might look like in terms of, you know, the importance of asking process oriented questions. So talk to me about um why you've done that in a certain way. Try and explain to me what your thinking was behind that certain practice or that certain activity. So that might be an example of kind of the type of questioning that we would want to see happen. Um, But if we can help coaches understand what this might look like and when to use these things, and as Chris said, when to dial these things up and when to dial them down, then, you know, I think we're going to see better coaching as a consequence um, and the constant discussion around should we be doing this or that, which again doesn't talk to the complexity of the coaching process. Well, let let let's let's just. I mean, Ed, you you started to break down some of the underpinnings of the, of these principles, and and let's combine to do that a little bit now, and 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 bring this to life for our audience. So these ten principles of instruction, um, I have an order in front of me, but I'm pretty certain there is no specific order and it's very much mix and match but it starts what with what's in front of me with a daily review um i mean to, to either of you i mean in a sporting context a, a daily review what what does that mean to either of you what could that look like within your own coaching um and why do you think that might be important why might that be a, a principle of instruction a daily review that doesn't sound like an instruction yeah, so if we, I guess if we put the, you know, there's a there's a couple of the principles that relate to reviewing stuff. Okay. So um, there's the there's the kind of the daily review, and then there's the weekly and monthly review. So I guess if we just class that as reviewing learning, yes, um, that might make sense. So uh, and and actually, um, you know, Sherrington, Tom Sherrington, who we referred to earlier, he he groups the principles into four strands. So he has strand one as sequencing concepts and uh, modeling, which includes um, principle two around presenting new material, principle four around providing models, and principle five, which is providing scaffolding for difficult tasks. Strand two kind of is questioning because um, kind of uh, principle three and six both relate to questioning. Strand three is 
daily review and the monthly review combined together. And then strand four is the stages of practice. So principles five, seven and nine. So if we take this concept of reviewing, that talks really nicely to, again, one of the most established um, kind of, um, I guess, learning uh, strategies around retrieval practice. So ultimately, why we would want a review is because there's um, there's something called the forgetting curve, which, you know, other people will talk about much better and more eloquently than I can. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we practice something and then over a period of time, we forget about what we've practiced. So the purpose of retrieval practice is to bring that back to the learner's attention so that we basically embed it better within the long term memory. So if we practice something on the Monday, then ultimately what we want to do is when the training session happens again on the Wednesday or whenever it is next, then we want to come back to the thing that we learned on the Monday in order to retrieve what it was that we did. And in doing so, um, you know, strengthen what we learned in our long term memory. So that's the general reason why we'd want to think about uh, reviewing previously learned information, previously learned material. And I think, you know, I see this 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 particular strand, if you like, has been really important in any form of curriculum design. So whether that's coaching, um, you know, and and actually it's just as applicable in terms of the way that we think about designing learning for coaches. So, you know, we, we teach coaches something. We probably then want to give a, some space between um, that learning so that they can apply it um, or that they kind of have time to kind of forget about it a little bit. And then we come back to it and we retrieve that information. So applicability both in coach development and and kind of, you know, the coaching of players. Well, I, I spoke with um, a teacher of teachers, Doug Lamov, who's written a, a really good book for, for sports and, and he includes that. I think we spoke about the forgetting curve and that's a big yeah. part of his book. And um, I mean, I, I think he's very vociferous in sort of saying the, the, the moment that you, you've uh, stopped teaching is the moment that people start to forget uh, things. So that forgetting curve starts uh, straight away. Um, uh, Chris, you must, uh, I'm guessing you use some kind of retrieval st- strategy within your coaching practice? Yes. Yeah. So what I, what I try to do is w- within sessions, but then ha- try to link sessions together. So I'm very, very much a whole task, as much as possible, a whole task type of person. So um, e- everything starts at the beginning again. Yep. <laughs> if that makes sense so you basically always go back to the beginning and and if you if you cleverly structure the whole task you can get your you can get the retrieval practice in the retrieval practice so I'll, I'll have something in the middle here that i that's that's new or a part of the focus of the session but in order to get to that bit who, who i'm working with need to retrieve something so uh, i mean a good example is with the um, it's not sport related, but it's it's an it kind of illustrates it a little better. Is that I'm doing work with the police at the moment. We're look, looking at whole tasks, so we and it's around arrest and self defence techniques. Ironically, or not ironically, particularly, but one of one of the issues is around verbal de escalation before you get to something physical with a police officer. So they might have to restrain somebody or put cuffs on them. So the focus of the session might be restraint and putting cuffs on something. But everything starts with my name is I'm here to do this. So they're basically retrieving, they're practicing the de-escalation before we get to the bit we're actually working on, i.e. the technical part of of a physical restraint or a mechanical restraint. So everything basically goes back to the beginning and we walk through it. And again, you can, and what I tend to do is think about, think about a scenario or a task and from the game or from the training pit, from the game, and then just pick it up and drop it into my training session. So I know it starts with a turnover of the ball here and I want to do these, these things and I, I want to end with this. So, but we always start that with the turnover and work forwards. We always go back and then we're starting to layer in issues and problems as we go forward. And the beauty of course is of the training pitch is we can freeze, we can rewind, we can slow, we can speed up, we can jump to different things, but I'm always thinking that that review retrieval piece is I just, and this is where we get, I'm going to steal a term repetition without repetition, right? So we're, we're basically doing the same thing over and over again, but we might have a branch off into a different direction. But the the task or the scenario is 
is basically from start to finish. But I'm getting that retrieval and that practice over and over again because we're not just jumping to this point. We're going to go all the way to the beginning. We're going to start with a turnover and then we're going to come forward to this bit. And then we're going to start again. We'll start with a turnover. But we're retrieving stuff that principles or thoughts about what happens when we turn over the ball before we get to this point, which is perhaps the new or the, the aspect of the session that we're working on. So I kind of sn try to sneak it in. <laughs> rather than deliberately say, right, today we're going to review what we did last session. That well, without doing it overtly, it's built in. It's built into the. It's built into the practice essentially. So we're doing it implicitly. And it. And, and again, as a coach, you're looking at it and going, okay, I've, uh, are we there? Do we need to maybe sidestep and do a little bit more? How can I think about exaggerating this or putting some conditions on on this to just make sure this is nailed? But for me, it's just starting to the beginning, walk through, get back to where you go. So you're always having that, that process of retrieval or review implicit within within the practice. Interesting. So we review to retrieve and retrieval helps us to put information into uh, shift information into long term memory, which is a store for learning. It holds our schemas. It holds our, our knowledge of the world. Um Back to you, Ed. Uh, we've talked about the reviews. You're the expert here of the 10, 10 principles. Where, where would you like to go next, mate? I won't, go, I won't go that far. But, I mean, if we think about... So so questioning is probably one of the most interesting, I think, in terms of its direct application mm -hmm. to coaching. And if I think about um, the body of work in coaching, and I, and I think this is where, again, it, it probably confuses a few, a few and contradicts a few around... Um, when people think of direct instruction, they would not be thinking of questioning. No. Uh, you know, questioning has been associated in the sport pedagogy literature very much with um, game-based coaching. And again, as we spoke about last time, you know, there's nothing to say that game-based coaching and instruction is incompa are incompatible with each other. We know that they're not. Um, but, but questioning is, uh, again, is, um, is probably, well... It, Question is one of the areas that Barrett Rosenshine has spoken about as an end in itself. So kind of a large body of his work is around um, teacher questioning. Um, kind of Tom Sherrington, who has kind of taken this work on and utilised it in an educational context, talks again about uh, at quite at length about questioning. Mm. And so there is a body of work, and Chris and I have, have, have done some work in, in terms of coach questioning in, 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 uh, in kind of coaching context. Mm. Um, and I think that we probably can conclude that coaches have difficulty really understanding what questioning strategies they should be employing. Um, and again, I think that there's a lot of stuff within the detail here around the notion of asking process oriented questions. And there's no such thing as a good or bad question. There's just a, a good or bad question related to the context. So Again, some of the earlier literature in coaching would suggest that we need to be asking open-ended questions the whole time. Not necessarily, um, you know, again, without kind of wishing to say it depends, it kind of essentially does, really. Um, you know, who, who are the learners? Kind of where are they at? And again, it, it's probably the case that it's a balance, isn't it? So there might be some stuff where the questions are more closed. Um, it is very much a case of checking for understanding to give I guess, the coach some assurance that at the very least the concept has been understood cognitively. Um, but again, you know, questions can be anything from, you know, explain that process to me, talk me through what you've just done. Um, you know, why, why did you think that? So again, there's a, there's loads of questioning frameworks out there. There's loads of different questioning strategies. Um, and again, you know, um, that there's there is a lot of work I think in the co well some work in the coaching and the sport pedagogy literature more broadly that that talks about some of these strategies around kind of you know um, the reflective tasks and trying to engage our athletes in kind of turn taking so that it's not the coach who dominates the the, the dialogic discourse between coach and player um, so again some of this stuff is discussed um, some of the ways that we can engage whole groups, the ways to engage kind of on an individual level, the need to think about small group discussion. You know, all of this stuff needs to come into the equation when we think about coach questioning and what it actually means in practice. Um, but again, it comes down to, you know, what's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve here? And what's the best tools for the job? 
Well, let me let me actually ask. Come to Chris. I mean, you know, Chris, you're a thirty year coach, veteran, and uh, please excuse me for using that term, veteran. Um, and uh, yeah. uh, you're you, well, you're a soccer coach, principally. You're a football coach. I mean, do you use a lot of um, questions in your coaching? And with that in mind, I mean, I know a lot of people listening in would sort of be thinking, well, football is a quick sport. You know, we want our players to enjoy themselves out there. Doesn't questioning just get in the way? Hey, um, what, what's how do you utilize questioning, if at all, and, and what's your thoughts on that? Again, I, I'm going to probably try and sidestep the question a little bit. It's a great question, and, and I am going to sidestep it a little bit and, and just think about the needs of the learner. So everything that I try to do is driven by the needs of the learner. So what does so, so bearing in mind what we're trying to achieve, bearing in mind who's standing in front of me, what does this person need? Mm. Now, do I do I need to engage with them in a dialogue about what 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 have they noticed? What do they see? What can they think of a different? You know, what might something else look like? What's a different solution here? Do I need to do that with this person, or do I need to do nothing, or do I just say you need to do this? When this happens, you need to do this. So it will be it will be very. So I've again, yeah. it seductive, isn't it to think about asking questions the whole time and it's all I'm doing this great thing here but that might not be what the person needs the, the person might need something else so questioning is definitely part yep. of it um, but it needs to be appropriate to the person and meet the needs in that of that person in at that at that time so that's kind of my which is not really an answer is it I've kind of dodged it a little bit but I, what I would say is again we, we look at the educational literature and something that we don't you know we, we we talk about yes process and task oriented goals but there's a you know Hattie's work tells us that kind of um, self-regulation and metacognition are really really good for learning so helping people understand their own learning and, and something I've been experimenting with is asking people not about the task, about their own learning. How, how, what have you noticed about how you're learning this? What have you noticed about how you understand this? Try to drag them into their, them thinking about, well, actually, coach, what I'm doing here isn't helping me at all. Okay, great. So what do we need to be doing? <laughs> so now we've got a dialogue around the process of learning for that person rather than it being specifically focused on the task. So for me, you know, something that, over recent years starting to think about okay so yes I can ask task related questions to try to get people thinking about different solutions and um, working out the answers here and and maybe it's testing their understanding or knowledge or maybe it's trying try to get them to think about something differently but also there's this kind of self-regulation metacognition piece around how do they understand their own learning <laughs> you know the number of times I've asked a question uh, around with players and they've just stood and looked at me and it's like, okay, so they're, they're, they're not even thinking about their own process of what works for them. So how, how can I help them if they don't even understand themselves what works for them? So it's something that, you know, for me, questioning is also has to have an element of that. Whether, whether you can do that in sessions and in practice, I don't know. But certainly certainly for me, more about reflection and review is is trying to, trying to encourage people to think about their own learning processes and understand their own needs. You know, I, I also, I'm a terrible golfer and I, I can, I can remember telling a coach to t stop asking me bloody questions and just tell me what to do, you know, and this person was absolutely, you know, what he was doing was absolutely fine, but I didn't have a clue. I was absolutely, you know, I had no anchor. I, I needed some worked examples and some demonstration and something to hook my hat on. And I didn't, I couldn't work it out for myself and got a bit tired of being asked. <laughs> and, you know, what I needed at that moment was him to tell me and show me, and then, then we can maybe get into some questioning. So there's a present, you know, again, we're in this paradox of coaches imposing their own ideas onto their players without actually stopping and saying, well, actually, what does this person really need from me? And is this the appropriate strategy right now? So yes, questioning is an important part of what we do, but it needs to be matched to the person's need in terms of task and where they are. But, and there's also this kind of metacognition, self-regulation piece around questioning, which I'm not sure any it, we do we go anywhere near it in coaching. Actually, now I, I'm 
from my experience. I mean, I could be could stand corrected, but I, I've not seen seen it covered anywhere or discussed anywhere particularly. Ed, you were going to jump in. Yeah, just to add, um, yeah. So a couple of things to sum up. You know, questioning isn't athlete centred coaching. As again, we we see many term it as, or we have seen it written as. Um, it is as you know, Chris has alluded to. It's what what are the needs and wants, and it's not just about the question, but the type of question that gets asked. And just just picking up on one of those points that Chris mentioned there. You know, I think where these principles can be particularly useful for coaches is just as much off field as on field. So when we are asking players to take part in review sessions, you know, that might be the time where we can, you know, do the kind of review material and asking questions that promote and engage uh, our athletes in metacognition, um, self-regulation, really deeper reflective thinking, which might not be possible during the kind of the practice session itself. So again, I would urge coaches to really think about these principles off field as much as on field. I I, I agree, and and just borrowing from my experiences working with, um, I suppose you could describe them as sports competitors at the very, very highest level. I can't, I can't, I can only but agree with you, Chris. In as much as I, I do sometimes wonder, and I'm talking about some of the best sports people in their sports, go to train, and, and obviously this is. Um, more apparent in team sports where you know in individual sports you can certainly as a golfer you set your own practice template essentially so you're you know you're the person who has to be has to have a great deal more education perhaps and than perhaps other uh, uh team um invasion sports uh competitors have but in team sports in my practice having spoken with players competitors at the very highest level they just i think often their perception of of good training good practice is i go and train and i train with intensity and that's it and there's no sense of what you're alluding to there chris which is well how do i learn you know that metacognition of piece of how am i acquiring knowledge here how what am i doing here what am i thinking how am i reflecting in the moment on the pitch in my small sided game and i i think your your um view of i actually don't think this is happening at all is, at least in my experience, actually quite accurate. I don't think it is. And, and again, we talked about evidence, didn't we? And if we look at if we look at Hattie's work on effect sizes, then you know there's a significant effect size on self regulation, basically getting people to engage in and understand their own process of learning, and that metacognition piece is really strongly linked to being of benefit to learners and yet it's another piece of work that's not really not really made its way into coaching unfortunately no. which perhaps it, it could be you know and 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 to ed's point really we're just hung up on whether it's an open or a closed question aren't we i mean that i mean that's as the conceptual pond we jump into the conceptual pond and it barely comes up to our knees doesn't it in as regards to questioning really in terms of understanding it and the breadth and where we could go with it in coaching and, and and just again, I know I said the final point was the final point, but <laughs> just, that's just uh, you know, sent something else off in terms of we need to move beyond seeing a question as a question in itself. Like let's move beyond just the what the question is that's being said. You know, there's a whole load of other stuff that we need to think about beyond that. So you know, how much time is given for a response? You know, who who's answering the question? Um, you know what's what's the nature in which there's a conversation that's going on here versus this being kind of dictated to by the coach so again some of our work shows that you know the whilst on the face of it it seems like it's a good open question what follows is the coach answering the question or rephrasing because like almost immediately because the the athlete doesn't answer or doesn't say anything um you know the 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 level of dialogue that takes place is minimal if if any at all so you know we we need to think about you know questioning as much broader than just the asking of the question to some of the stuff that surrounds it really and and i think as well ed i think it's an important point is about really listening to the answer (laughs) you know we we ask we we ask a question as you know it's almost like almost like being a barrister you never ask a question you don't already know the answer to right so as coaches, we ask a question and we, we want to hear this thing. 
And if we don't hear this thing, we almost just just kind of push that to reply and either rephrase the question or do it again. But actually, what what is our athlete? What are our players saying to us? How are they answering the question? And it, 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 there's a real danger of it might be something really innovative or clever or insightful that doesn't sound like the thing you were expecting to hear or wanted to hear. So again, we could almost inadvertently be snuffing out a little bit of creative thought and you know and and, and really impacting the way that we engage with people i this coach I, I he's asked i've been asked a question i've given an answer which actually is pretty clever and quite original a way of answering this question and it's almost been snuffed out and he's asked me a question because he wants to hear this so i'll just tell him that okay so you know and you and that kind of sets a precedent with the players about how you engage with them and how you engage with questions. So for me, it's always really listening carefully about what is the an- what is the answer here and is there a subtext to it or am I, you know, I ask this question because I want to hear this answer, but that answer could come in different ways in different formats or there could be something else going on here. So for me, it's really listening carefully to what's being said to you and not dismissing it and trying to move on to a different thing because you want to hear these words or want to he- hear it said in a particular way. Well, let's... Um... Let, let, let's round things up by um, – I'm just going to go through these 10 principles again, um, and, and, and then it would be great to get some uh, an idea or ideas from you, Ed, with regard um, how people can start to uh, learn these or apply these in, in, in their coaching practice. Uh, and then perhaps we'll move over to you, Chris, and, and sort of get a, some final thoughts on – being evidence-based or however you might like to to conclude and round things up today. Um, We've been talking today about Rosenshine's principles of instruction. Uh, We've we've, um, built on the first podcast episode that we did that said, look, we have to be able to broaden our definition of um, direct instruction. And so we can u- utilize Barrack Rosenshine's principles of instruction. Those uh, principles are underpinned by cognitive scientific evidence, by direct observation of master teachers, and by research on cognitive supports and scaffolds. Um, so it's quite, quite comprehensive in terms of its underpinning. And those 10 principles, and we've really only covered two, three, four today, although we've, we've alluded to most of them. One is a daily review, present new material using small steps, ask questions, provide models, guide student practice, check for student understanding, obtain a high success rate, provide scaffolds for difficult tasks, independent practice, weekly and monthly review. In essence, Rosenshine has broken down what great teaching looks like to help the people we are striving to help learn. Ed, over to you in terms of, you know, what are the best next steps for those listening in? How can they, how can they access this stuff and then maybe first steps to go away and start practicing this stuff? Yeah, sure. So, um, like anything these days, probably type this into Google or YouTube, and you'll see yeah, like, loads of videos and loads of um, interpretations of Rose and Shine's work. Um, and I think there's some really great stuff out there that that explain this very clearly. Um, but for me, start with Rose and Shine's paper in 2012, which, as I say, type Rose and Shine 2012 into Google Scholar or into Google. And you'll be able to access the PDF for free. It's about eight pages that talks about um, each of these principles and the underpinning evidence for each. Um, so I would always start with the original work as the as a starting point, and then you know um, watch or engage in podcasts and videos and blogs and whatever until your heart's content. Really. Um, so so that's kind of where I would start thinking about this in terms of kind of application in practice. Again, just to reiterate what we said at the start, you know, this is not a list. This is not a case of let's tick off every time we do this yeah. in our coaching. I think it's like anything, you know, when we're starting out with anything, you know, new ideas, you know, maybe take an aspect of these principles and really try and think what what might this look like? How can I try and understand kind of how this might work? So it might be taken in the concept of questioning and and say, okay, well, 
you know, what what might kind of the questions be that I would need to ask? You know, when would I need to ask them? Um, how do I know that I'm getting a sense of I'm asking kind of, you know, appropriate questions at, at, at the right time? What, what's my purpose for asking them in the first place? So, you know, it might be um, a stimulant for, for reflective questions to the coach. And, you know, again, I, I, you know, we've said it a little bit, but I really do think this serves as a really useful framework for which coach developers and coach educators can think about these principles within their coach development and coach education practices in terms of supporting coaches in understanding what this looks like. Um, because, you know, ultimately the evidence comes from the classroom. These things happen in the classroom. So, um, again, for those that maybe would question the applicability or transfer into kind of coaching settings, um, I don't think you can question the applicability into uh, coach education settings because they are classroom based predominantly. Um, and so I think these serve as a really useful framework for coach educators and developers to work from and with. When I look at those principles, when I think about Rose and Shine's work and I reflect back on my golf coaching, it I, it makes me think if I was still doing that, if I was still coaching golf or coaching a, a, any other sport, um, it would help me answer the what, the how, the why. You know, what am I doing? How am I doing it? Why am I doing it this way? And I suppose the why is, 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 is the big question here. To finish things off, Chris, I don't know if that prompts anything in your mind, whether you want to sort of c complete things here with uh, some thoughts on being evidence underpinned or, or, or whatever wisdom you want to throw at us to, to, to finish the, the episode off. Uh, please, please do. I think, um, you know, to Ed's point, you know, with, with everybody that I work with in a coach development space, you know, we look at, we look at session plans and, in re over recent years, people have tagged on, you know, the reflection box at the bottom. But the, se the session plan really is very X's and O's and sets and reps. And, and it's very, you know, what, you know, what does this thing look in front of me? And, and I always and have done since I've been working in coach development, really, is that, okay, we need to add another column for you, the coach. Mm. <laughs> what? So, so a lot of the stuff isn't shooting from the hip. It's pre-planned, and you think, you know, even thinking about it before the session. So, you know, to Ed's point around questions, I know what my coaching points are. How might I rephrase those into questions? You know, what are what are the likely things that are going to happen in this session, where I know that th this breaks down in this way, or this player has this issue, or these things happen. So I know that this is going to be a coaching point. You know. But how do I present it in different ways? How might I present it into a question? How might I, you know, how might I put it into different ways? So for me, planning this stuff up front is really, really useful. So, you know, if I know that I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a session working and I need to move to this, I know what that looks like. So if I want to interleave or if I want to space or if I want to use questioning, there's some some semblance of a plan in place. So, you know, I can't un underestimate the power of a column on the session plan for the coach in terms of their behaviour, in terms of, you know, what, just get a sense of what, what I'm going to do and how I might do this. Because, some, you know, a lot of this stuff you just can't do off the cuff. You mm -hmm. can't make it up. You have to think about it in advance. You can't just come up with brilliant, insightful questioning off you know it with just by reacting to stuff that's in front of you so planning this stuff in advance building up a bank of questions building up a bank of responses i think is a is a really useful tool and a habit to get into so just by adding that extra column and and for me you know the, the evidence informed is really really important we can't ignore it we just can't we just can't ignore the weight and i've said it already today really we just can't ignore the weight of evidence around learning. Yes, there's issues around you know that kind of external validity. Does this transfer to this place? How, can I be certain? Well, I don't know. Let's try though. You know, there's you 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 look at stuff and you read it and you think about it and you look at the evidence. And okay, okay, this is a quite a compelling case. So why don't you know? Why don't I give it a go? Why don't I why don't I see how it works and try this stuff rather than just straight away reject it? I mean, there's plenty of practice that's out there in coaching that's based essentially on 
case studies and anecdotes and circular evidence <laughs> and we seem perfectly happy to to throw that into our into our coaching but when we when we have some genuine well researched principles that are strongly connected to learning that have a huge evidence base we somehow seem skeptical so i i don't know it feels a bit upside down to me a lot of the time in terms of in terms of where we are with coaching and of course and you know any researchers listening let's let's get some research going let's get more research about coaching practice that actually says okay how does this stuff work how does it map across does it you know are there tweaks it, through my own trial and error you know and then we've discussed my little you know from based off rosenshine i've kind of anecdotally developed my own principles that i think about in terms of my own session you know and that needs research but it's based off the original the original thing that, and trying to make it applicable to coaching fantastic fascinating well, look, thank you so much, both of you, for, for coming back on and for um, extending, helping us to extend our understanding of direct instruction. Um, it's it's something that is uh, as broad as it is deep, so it, it is challenging um, for, for coaches, but I, but I think it's something that's worthwhile looking into and, and um, researching more. I'm sure that uh, you've both tapped the interest of the of the audience. I know you both do some form of social media, at least Twitter. So how can uh, people find you, discover your work, and get in touch if you'd like them to? Um, Ed, let's start with you. Yep, so um, email e.cope at elbra.ac.uk. Um, so that's e.cope. Uh, at elbra.ac.uk and then at edcoat1 on Twitter and I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to also just remind people if they haven't come across it that Chris and I have currently got a call for special issue um, within sport Co- the Sport Coaching Review Journal um, which is focused on coaching behaviour and practice so we are inviting submissions for that which will hopefully attend maybe to some of the things that we are discussing here um, but certainly looking to extend our knowledge and understanding of coaches and their practices. Fantastic. And and you, Chris? Uh, I'm on Twitter with the incredibly unoriginal at Coach C1. That's my handle. I did that like 10 years ago, so before I really understood what Twitter was or is, I'm not sure I still understand what it is, but I'm on Twitter, and you can find me on the Loughborough website if you really want to email me. Simple is good, Chris. Simple is good. All right. Well, look, thank you both so much uh, for coming on. And it's been just a fascinating uh, episode. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast. And I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Site Show. And if you have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.